I'm Skylar Tibbetts, Associate Professor of Design Research here at MIT. I have a few main roles. The first is the Editor-in-Chief of the 3D Printing and Additive Manufacturing Journal, and we cover additive manufacturing across a variety of disciplines. Uh, in the department, I direct all of the undergraduate programs, so the undergraduate architecture major, architecture minor, design major, and design minor, and we have amazing faculty and classes taught across those different degree programs. And then I coordinate and uh, direct the self-assembly lab here in our department as well. Um, our lab consists of about 15 people. This is a bit of an old slide, but we have a, a mix of undergraduate masters of architecture, SMARCs, PhDs from many different programs, art, architecture, design, computer science, material science, mechanical engineering, a number of people, many different backgrounds. Um, and all of this started from my background in architecture and computer science. Uh, I was originally a SMARC student in the design computation program here and then did computer science. And I was really fascinated how computation became a new tool for design. This is Sutherland Sketchpad invented here at MIT in 1963 that obviously has contemporary computational tools like sophisticated simulation or algorithmic design or analysis or now AI and machine learning. And all of that started here. I was interested in how code became this new tool for design. And there's a similar story with digital fabrication. This is 1955 at MIT, the first time a computer was connected to a milling machine that obviously has its contemporaries in 3D printing or laser cutters, water jets, CNC routers, et cetera. So code was a new language for design and code was a new language for fabrication. But I was interested in the third, how code could be a new tool for construction. You know, at the time I was building all of these mass customized installations at galleries around the world with individual components and it was algorithmically designed, digitally fabricated, and then manually assembled. And I was interested in what that new form of construction could be that would enable all of the information to be embedded in the parts. As a grad student, I was working with Neil Gershenfeld's lab, the Center for Bits and Atoms, under a DARPA programmable matter grant. And we were making programmable matter at the time using small scale and then all the way up to meter scale robots that could reconfigure and transform. Um, and quickly, I became very critical of my own work in this, uh, thinking that really, if you want to scale up to architecture, it's not about embedding robots into buildings or embedding robots into bricks because they're gonna be far too energy intensive and costly and they'll fail too often. It's about embedding information and materials. And so all of my research since then has been about how to build more agency and capabilities in our physical materials so they can sense, react, transform and assemble themselves. And we basically do this with three main ingredients. We look at the material properties like wood, for example, and how that responds to different activations like moisture, or if you have heat and temperature, you might activate polymers or metals. And then we digitally fabricate those through different forms like 3D printing or knitting or weaving or lamination. And we build 2D and 3D geometries that then have some type of functional behavior like a transformation. So we get sensing and actuation through geometry and material properties. And we've done this through our 4D printing work where objects transform underwater or our active auxetics work that transforms based on sunlight or 30 to 40 Celsius or our active textiles work with fibers that transform based on moisture or pH or temperature or a new digital fabrication process, rapid liquid printing, where we can print soft robotics out of silicone rubber that morph from one shape to another. And our self-assembly work is looking at components that can assemble themselves underwater, in this case, to make a chair or in the air. These are large weather balloons filled with helium that assemble into cubic lattice structures. And when the helium dies, it then comes back to the ground and you're left with these large space frame structures. And all of this work is simple materials that respond to the forces of their environment to either transform or to sense or react or to assemble themselves. Most recently, this has been translated to the Maldives in a collaboration with a group there called Invena, where we're looking at how to take our self-assembly and self-organization work and propose that for a new method of construction, basically collaborating with the forces of nature to build rather than destroy. And we set up experiments in our lab where we pump waves or have different currents and we study how the geometry underwater influences the type and amount or quantity of accumulation of sand in different areas. 
And we try to understand what that relationship between the geometry and the force of the ocean is. In this case, it's a, a six foot long tank. Uh, and then at full scale, it's roughly 20 meters or four me by four meters by two meters, just to give you a sense of scale. We've studied sand ripple patterns and different accumulations of sand and how that's influenced by the relationship to the force of the ocean and the geometry. So basically we're proposing these specific geometries that would be placed underwater. We then scale those up. We've done two field experiments at full scale in the Maldives. Uh, and then we study those over the course of months and years through satellite imagery and drone photography and physical measurements to try to understand the relationship between the field and the lab and how we can promote the maximum amount of accumulation. Um, over the course of roughly four months, we saw 300 cubic meters of new sand in our latest field experiment. So the, it's still early days, but this is really promising to us. And what we're proposing is a basically a submersible bladders that can adapt and transform like a adaptable art artificial reef in a way that can then work with the forces of the ocean to promote the accumulation of sand and help grow these islands over time. So all of this research is really trying to address how we build things and how we make the things that we build smarter and smarter. And rather than going towards electromechanical robots as the only way to make smart things, we focus on smarter materials, embedding information in those materials so they can sense, transform, assemble themselves, et cetera. So we believe today we build smart machines and smart robots. Tomorrow we'll build smarter materials and environments.